welcome to Reza Block. Um, lucky to have Matt here with us. Matt Coleman of Stroud Coleman Bloodstock. Matt is one of the most prolific buyers of Reza. Uh, and I'm actually going to read the list because there's that many horses. Uh, he bought Sam Zamali, grade one winner, 75 grand. Robin and Avon, grade one winner, 47 grand. Jeez, Matt, I, I was going to say I have some nice horses you look at, but I don't think you could afford them. Prince of Lear, <laughs> winner, 170 grand. Okay, okay, we can talk. Uh, Summer Sands, listed winner, grade one place, 85 grand. Flemington Princess, grade three winner, 80 grand. Midnight Sands won five and a bounce in Dubai, 80 grand. So, okay, it's fair to say you're an expert. So... <laughs> I guess what people would really like to know is uh, the process. So, do you, I mean, do you just show up at the sale, or have you got a pedigree analysis, or am I right in saying you have sort of a photographic memory? Oh, a bit, yeah. Oh, a good memory. Yeah, I do have a pretty good memory. Um, it's it's a combination of factors. I don't do a lot of pedigree research beforehand or catalog research. I would tend to talk to a good number of the vendors just to just sound them out about the horses they like before the sale uh, and I if I can I try and look at all the horses before they breeze just because every horse in the sale try to I mean obviously in some sales it's more more realistic than others or if, I mean if there's a you know something like the guinea sale where there's 200 250 horses I'd probably go through and look at the 100 or 150 that I most liked on pedigree or the, you know, or I'd go to the vendors and just say, show me the horses you like. And they say, oh, that's no good. Just look at those. Um, right. So, cause, because the reason I do that is because when they breeze, I then have the horse in my head when it breezes and I, you know, a horse would come and I'd say, oh, that's that acclimation filly. I really liked her. Or that's the one that so-and-so told me is very good. So it concentrates the mind a bit when you're watching 200 breeze up horses go, you know, individually it just helps to focus your brain and i'm still pretty old school i actually stop watch the breeze ups and i have assistant sat next to me and i'd stop watch the two furlongs and a gallop out and i'd tell my assistant what the times are they type them in the computer and i'd give a few words of comment and they type them in on the computer and um, the reason do that and I do get the electronic times as well but the reason I do the stopwatch is one it makes me remember the the breeze as if I you know if something breezes and does a good time it sticks in my head straight away and second or secondly it's a backup to the electronics which aren't always infallible at getting correct times and third it allows me to whittle the list down quicker if a horse breezes and I think well that breeze that you know it was very hard pushed and it looked quick but it did a slow time i probably think oh it's probably no good because if a horse you know if a horse is looks like a sprinter is quite hard pushed in the breeze but does a slow time you'd probably think oh it's not much whereas if you have a horse in your head that's more of a stayer you'd be much more forgiving with its time and just more more watch how it moves and its attitude and that sort of thing so having seen the horse it allows me to have an expectation of what the breeze is going to be Okay. And from that point, I then go back to the sales ground, formulate a list of what I want to look at. And Anthony Stroud, who I work with, we'd, we'd sit down and go through everything together and sort of swap ideas and swap thoughts. And then I'd wait for the, I might wait for the electronic times or I might not. I might just go and start looking at the horses. Probably look at the, you know, hopefully I've seen them once. So it's more a case of just going to see how they come out of the breeze, probably trot them up. And again, just chat to the vendors and I also try and if I can chat to a few of the breeze up jockeys if any if any of them I know have ridden a horse that I like the breeze up of and I might chat to a few of the guys showing the horses because they will you know some of them work on your farms 24 7 so they know the horses and you might glean a bit of information that they might say that the, the head the vendor who's you know heading up the operation might not have told you or something like that so it's just, it's just Information gathering process. I'll have to tune up my day. It just depends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, de it depends which client I'm buying for. I mean, the, my main client's the Cool Silk Partnership. That we've had a lot of success together with Breeze Up Horses. And Peter and Chris, I would send them the times. As soon as my, I'd, I'd, I'd 
print or email the, the document that's been done by my assistant while I'm watching the breeze. As soon as the breeze finishes, I'd email that to Chris and Peter so they get my times and comments straight away. And then, you know, sometimes they're at the sale with me. This is if they're not there. If not, I go back to the office and print them off. So they've got my time straight away. And then we'd cross check those against the electronics um, when we get the electronic times. And then obviously you can play with the electronic data in terms of gallop outs and, you know, stride length. And you, know, you can go into data ad infinitum in terms of, you know, the, the guys we use have do some. Do you do stride length as well? We have that information. Yeah, I mean, I, I would put a limited amount. How much amount. weight do you put on that map? No, I wouldn't put a great deal of importance in it. I would look at it, but I'd more go on my eye about what I think of the breeze and how the horse moves. I, I just think that when you're watching a breeze, it's more about what you think of the horse, how it carries itself, how it moves. The stride length I would I'd look at, but you can quite often tell the big striding horses anyway when they go. I mean, you can, you know, if you're watching, yeah. you watch a thousand breezes in a year, so you get a pretty good eye of what, what's got a good stride and what hasn't. And, you know, not all sprinters have a big stride, so it also depends on what sort of horse you're buying. I mean, if you're trying to buy a fast horse for Royal Ascot in the usual year, you know, you're probably less worried about stride length. If you're trying to buy a, a classic type of horse, you probably are a bit more worried with stride length. So, they're all different tools to factor into buying different sort of horses. And obviously it then depends on what budget you're buying at. And if you've got 300,000 or 30,000, you obviously have to be far more forgiving or far more inventive, depending on if you've got a small budget or you can buy the really obvious horse with a big sexy pedigree if you've got a lot of money. Right, so if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you, you like to time them yourself, you like to get an electronic time, you like to get a stride length, but ultimately those are valuable pieces of information maybe, but ultimately yeah. you, you kind of decide yourself based on the, the, the horse you like. Yeah, and I mean the good horses we've, we've bought, you know, have been bought for various reasons. I mean, some of them have done a fast time. You know, Anthony and I have bought, you know, some other good horses that have been, you know, breathed slow, but have ended up very good stayers. Um, we bought a horse called Nearly Caught for Huey Morrison, who won a load of group races over two miles plus. We bought him out of the Guineas Breeze off Norman Williamson. He did a slow time, but he was just a, a big, nice horse by New Approach who just looked quite raw and just like he needed time. And, you know, Huey was the perfect trainer for him and he, he won a boatload of stakes races, but, you know, not till he was three, four, five years old. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a process of, using all the tools you have but I, i'd put a lot of importance in what the vendors tell you because you know you guys live with the horses 24 7 so you know i'd make a point of talking to each vendor as i go around to ask them what they think of each horse and you know obviously i, I make my own decision but it's you know there's no one particular tool i use over another i mean the times are important but they're not the be all and end all right um I, I, so just to, I, I would put quite a lot of importance about how the horse gallops out. You know, over two furlongs is not not that long a distance for most race horses. So I put a lot of importance about how the horse gallops out. And when I bought Sands of Marley, for example, at Ascot, he was the very first horse to breeze at that sale, and he he did a good time, but his gallop out was phenomenal. And he went round the bend at Ascot and disappeared down the Swinley Bottom. Explain what, explain what the gallop is. He rode him, and when I spoke to Mickey, um, just what the horse, how the horse carries on after the two furlong poles. So if the if the breeze up is over two furlongs, you know the horse, you know the horse obviously then still continues. And so I I um, just keep an eye on how they go after the two furlong pole. For the horses that breeze quick over two, and then sort of fall in a hole, as it were, I'm always very skeptical of them. I like a horse to continue its speed and continue its action, and like it's got plenty right. more tank. Because yeah. there's, there's, no, yeah. there's, no, there's no races over two furlongs, so you need to find horses that keep going. Right, right, fair enough. The, ga the gallop out or the, the pull up or uh, kind of, it, it seems like it's become more and more important over the last, people have gotten onto it. It's become more and more important to purchasers over the last couple of years. 
it obviously produced results as well. Yeah. You and also, yeah, I mean, there's been some people in the industry talking about maybe giving you, you guys the opportunity to breeze some of the more middle distance horses over three furlongs, which I think make I think makes sense. I mean, not everyone's in favour of it, but I I would say that if you guys had the choice of breeding breezing a horse over two or three, you know, I don't I don't see anything wrong with that, and I put you know particularly for the horses that need a bit more time or a bit more distance i don't think there's any any problem with breezing horse over three films in fact it's probably beneficial well i think i think it'll be hugely beneficial i think um if 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 the breeze is over three what i do with my horses in february march april will be far more in line with what willie haggis or archie watson or any trainer in england or ireland is doing with it You'd have to ride a breeze over a tree a lot different because you got guys like yeah. you clocking the gallop out. So it's really almost a four, you know, it's three and a half. You tell yeah. a lot about it. One thing that will happen if we do that, Matt, is there won't be two seconds between the first and the last horse. Yeah, you know, but you would if it's time breeze over the lane two fur over three furlongs. I think, you know, for example, most of the ask ask at breeze up and Ascot breeze up and Dongaster breeze up type of horses this year, and some and plenty of the Craven horses are designed to be sprinters. So you'd probably breeze them over too. But the horses, you know, for the Guinea sale at Newmarket, Arcana sale, that are typically later maturing, need a bit more distance. You probably breeze them right. over three, and just get them to you know because in in America you can breeze. I think you can breeze a furlong or two furlongs. And yeah, I think you can, one or two. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't see any reason over here why you can't do two or three. And you just decide, you guys decide yourself. You say, you know, I've got a big galloping new approach. He's going to go three. I've got a fast Kodiak. She's going to go two. And I think that, that to me, makes a lot of sense because you're trying to show off the horses to its best. I mean, breezing a 16 one hand staying horse over two furlongs is not really what it's designed to do. And I also think it puts right. less on you guys to have to squeeze those horses up to make them do a time yeah or, or or i mean the big damage maybe that focusing on the two farm does is we don't buy those horses then like the breeze up has produced three-year-old classic winners two last year so yeah. if there's a three farm breeze we can buy a different kind of horse yeah i think that's the big the big it's just an idea, and it would be up to you vendors whether you wanted to do it or not. But it's um, it just makes more sense. Spoken, we spoke to Blarney, and he, he's on for it. A lot of the vendors are on for it. Uh, I, I, I had suggested it this year, and I was going to do a, a, a blog on it, but there's just so much changed already this year um, on advice. I didn't even put out the, the blog because if we could just keep, if we could get. If we get a sale going this year, we don't need to make any unnecessary changes, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. It's, an idea for next it's, year. Some, it's something worth discussing. Okay. So you, you have clients, major clients, to buy at, for the breeze up. So if a guy wants to get in, I mean, how, do, how does a person get involved? Do you have syndicates as well? I mean, you have to have a huge amount of money. Although, still, 70 grand is a huge amount of money for a lot of people. What about... Uh, do you have a product where, you know, a bunch of guys can get in or, or are we, if someone comes in, are they going to be getting the ones who still don't want? Or how do you manage, like, you, I mean, you, have, you South Coleman have multiple owners and you seem to be able yeah, to buy I mean, winners for all of them. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the challenge at every sale. Um, it actually, surprisingly, it tends to work out pretty well. I mean, I'm very open with clients and I would say, on a particular horse, you know, cool silk, I'm going to try and buy that up to X amount of money. And then the client might say, well, I've, I've got more, or they might say, cool, don't worry about it. I'll think about another one. But, you know, it generally works out that certain, you know, they're not going to buy that many horses. So if you're at a sale of 200 horses, you know that 20 of them are going to make loads of money and most clients can't afford them. So you know, it, it tends to work out all right. I mean, I've, you know, I've, you know, Robin of Navan I bought for Harry Dunlop for 47,000. 
you know, I bought a filly in the Guinea so last year for 10,000 for Amy Murphy, who won her first two races and, you know, looks a nice filly. So it's, it's a matter that you, you know, I, I'm just open with people and I say, you know, X client is going to have a go on this horse. And there's no reason why, you know, Anthony and I sometimes bid against each other. You know, he has someone that wants to buy it. I have someone that wants to buy it. And it's just an open marketplace. So um, it tends to function fine. And, um, you know, certain people tend to go to the rate, to the, to the sales to buy a certain type of horse. I mean, so, you know, for example, you mentioned the cool silk guys. In a usual year, they're always looking for Royal Ascot type horses. So they're, you know, they're, they're buying those sharper types. Whereas other people want to buy horses that you know are going to need a bit more time and a bit more distance. Right. Tell me, by reputation, you are. I know you buy lots of yearlings and national hunt horses and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure you do mares as well. But by reputation, you're more of a breeze up buyer. Why have you kind of specialised in that? What's attractive about the breeze up to you? Or do you feel you've been aged? Um. Uh. I don't particularly specialise in the breeze ups. It's sort of come because I've got you know some clients that let me buy breeze up horses, and I don't I don't know why I've had so much success doing it. I guess it's just a Anthony and I both have had you know Anthony bought Society Rock out of the breeze ups who did no time at all, and he bought um, Al Ali who won the Norfolk last year. He bought him, and you know the two of us have had loads and loads of group. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we've had a lot of good horses over the last few years. I don't know why it works really. We just, you know, whatever, you know, we seem to have the knack of picking the right ones. And, um, you know, I watch a lot of racing. Maybe there's something to do with that, to do with it, that you get an eye for what a good horse looks like. Um, but at the end of the day, an agent is only as good as his clients. And you need the clients to come with you and you need the clients to, to you know, work with you, give you the budgets to buy the horses. So, um, you know, I don't know why I've been successful buying breeze up horses. I mean, I buy some yearlings, I buy jumpers, I buy brood mares, I buy foals. But, um, you know, the, yeah, the breeze ups have been good to us. So, um, I, don't, I don't particularly... Well, you can only buy a one sale, where to buy? Sorry, say again. Like, and I don't mean a sale company. I mean, if you could only buy yearlings, foals, or horses in training, or breeze ups. Oh. Um, well, I'd probably have to say breeze ups, because that's where I've had two group one winners recently, but I sort of pride myself on trying to Good do it. Here. It wasn't a trick question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on a, I'm on a breeze up blog. So yeah, but um, Duh. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about all types of racing, breeding, etc. So I'm, you know, I'm, I enjoy working in all, all parts of the industry. And like I said, we're only as good as our clients. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to buy and I work hard to buy the best horse I can at whatever sale I'm at for whatever client it is, whether they've got 5,000 or 5 million. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say you like the ones with 5 million better though, right? No, I like the ones that win big races. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. I'm really not driven by purchase price. I'm driven by success. I get much more, I get much more of a kick about watching Sands of Mali win the champion sprint than I do about buying a horse for 200,000. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're all in it to win. Yeah. When when I'm when I'm when I'm seventy five years old, I won't be remembering my horse I bought for two hundred. I'll be remembering the Group One winners. Yeah, yeah. So what about this year? I mean, we have we got twenty million. At least they cost twenty million worth to breeze up horses. Um, you're going to be like a fox in the chicken coop, I suppose, are you? Have you got lots of yeah. orders? Yeah, I've got a few. Well, hopefully. I mean, I think the, the first thing to say is British racing and Irish racing, hopefully, has to start in early June. That is key. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to put a huge challenge on the breeze up sales if that doesn't happen. Um, I don't think yeah. it's ideal. I see that they've announced today they're going to run two year old races at Royal Ascot. That's not ideal, particularly for the sharper type of breeze up horse. Um, because obviously they're going to run the two-year-old races at Royal Ascot. That, that's what they've said today. Yeah, on the Royal Ascot date. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So which is not a great when that when that's the two-year-old maidens prior to that. 
Yeah, there's, well, mo most of the horses in the Royal Ascot races will be unraced. Yeah, so they're going to have two weeks to run two old races in England before Royal Ascot, and the Iris won't have any races. So. Right. I think you had one, didn't you? Wow. So then that, and cur currently Royal Ascot's going to be before any of the breeze up sales. So that's not ideal. And I, I personally would love it if they pushed the Royal Ascot two rod races back into July or August. Um, yeah. From the, one, from the standpoint of the breeze up sales, but two, I don't see how you can run a, a pattern race to get the best result when 70 or 80% of the field are unraced. I don't, I, you're not going to get the best result you should. For a start, it'll be like a point of point. You'll have four divides. Well, exactly. Everyone's just going to run everything, aren't they? You know, if you've got a, if you've got a colt that goes okay, you're just going to run him in the Norfolk or the Coventry. Just you think, well, I might as well. So, Why not? Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's one point. But yeah, and on a more general basis, yeah, I have got some orders, and I actually I think talking to other agents, I think there is a good amount a good amount of business out there and a good amount of orders. But Great. we need racing to start. In an ideal world, we need sales to happen where at least the bloodstock agents can get to the sale to watch the breeze and look at the horses. Because you know, I think the online idea works quite well with breeze ups in terms of having breeze up videos and lots of different types of information, heights and weights and you know, confirmation videos. I think all that's important. But from a perspective of trying to encourage clients to buy, it's much easier to encourage clients to buy when I've seen the horse, I've watched the breeze, I've spoken to you guys about the horses. And it's, you know, if I'm sat in my office, the client sat in their office, it's, you know, it's not as easy to get people enthused about buying horses. I'll still participate for sure if it's an online sale, but I think at least getting the agents to the sales will, it will just get it going, it'll get people's blood up and I th yeah, if we can by any means get people to see, watch the breeze and see the horses at a sale, it will, it will really help. I think. Okay. All righty. Then we're done. Um, thanks, Matt. No worries. Well, all um, the best. And, um, yeah.